Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome back to EWTN's Living Divine Mercy. Now, last week we started a four-part series on something you don't hear a lot about anymore, the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And we decided to make a show about each one, and last week we started with death, so this week we're going to be talking about judgment. Now, we will all die, okay? This is a reality, and the church teaches that right after that, we will be judged. But did you know that we will go through two judgments, both a particular judgment and a general judgment? So what are they? We are Immediately after our death, we will undergo what is called a personal judgment. This is from Hebrews 9.27. Dogmatic Revelation teaches that each soul goes to Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, while the body remains here on earth and decays, unless you're an incorruptible. <laughs> we will then enter into the state of eternity that our choices on earth merit. Heaven, hell, or a visit to purgatory. So, it may sound strange, but we find hope in God's judgment because God is the fair, omniscient judge. He will take everything into account, including our weakness and broken human nature. He wants to have mercy on us. Thank you. <laughs> so, remember, the only way for a soul to be lost to hell is to die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin. And for a sin to be mortal, three things have to be present, one of which, the third, is free will. And God knows that sometimes things like addiction cause us to do things we wouldn't normally do and not have free will. He knows our trials and our struggles. What we have to remember is that God is the judge, not Satan. Satan is just an accuser, like a prosecuting attorney. Um, and, and Jesus is like the defense attorney, pleading for us at the right hand of the Father. Jesus defends the soul against the devil, who will bring up anything and everything he can to condemn us. But remember, he can only bring up unconfessed sins. He cannot bring up sins that we have confessed in the confessional. So, because those are gone, so Please get to confession. Confession not only cleanses us of our sins, but removes us from the hands of the devil. Now, that is our particular judgment. But what about the general judgment and what happens to our bodies? Well, after our personal judgment, we hope to go to heaven. And if we do, we will be there in our spiritual soul without our body. But somehow, that is not complete, because in our human nature, we are both body and soul. So why has only our soul in heaven? Well, eventually our body will join us. Jesus, in his full human nature, redeemed not just our souls, but our bodies as well. So that is why we have the general resurrection. We'll be reunited with a perfect body. I always laugh because I always just think, well, uh, I'll be six foot eight. But no, that's not what God looks at. He looks at the light of our bodies that shine and reflect Christ when we were on this earth. And this is how Jesus was in the transfiguration, bright light transfigured. And so we will have the same body we had on earth, but somehow it'll be different, changed in a moment. At the general judgment, the just are converted to a glorified body, and the unjust are converted to a darkened body, grotesque and deformed. We know the general judgment from Acts 25. And at the second coming, Christ will appear in the heavens. And on the last day, Christ will judge all humanity, it says in Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats, where those who did good works of love will have eternal life, but those who did not will go to the eternal fire. And everyone, whoever lived in the world ever at any time will be present at the general judgment. The Bible tells us that all the nations will be gathered into the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is Joel 
And Matthew 24, 31 says the angels will gather the elect and the Lord will bring everything to light. This shows the effects of what you have done in your life, good and bad, and the ramifications as they are played out. For instance, you'll see how your choices affected your children, their children, and the whole world, and even how the world changed from your actions, such as an abortion you had and all the people who were never born later because of it. Now, at the particular judgment, we will see how our sins and good works affected ourselves until death. But at the general judgment, we will see how our sins and good works affected the whole world and how they continued affecting the world until the end of time and how they affected everyone. Also at the general judgment, all of creation will learn about our personal judgment and we will learn about theirs. Uh oh. <laughs> and so <clears throat> there will be no more secrets. Matthew 12, 36 says, I tell you on that day of judgment, you will have to give an account of every careless word you utter. And Revelation 20, 13 says, all will be judged by what they have done. But again, what about confessed sins, as we mentioned? Those are forgotten. So go to confession. If God does reveal something of your sin that's been confessed at the general judgment, it will be for his greater glory. The key is to stay in a state of grace, meaning having no mortal sin on your soul. So keep praying, receiving the sacraments, and loving one another. We also have a major advocate for us at the time of our judgment, and that is our mother Mary, given to us by Jesus on the cross. She is the spouse of the Holy Spirit, who is our advocate. God wants us to be with him forever in heaven, so he won't leave us alone. He won't give up on us. Um, and even if we don't help ourselves, he gives us a great intercessor to help us. And here is something very interesting. Jesus comes from the line of David. And in the Davidic kingdom, who was the queen? It wasn't the wife of the king, but rather the mother of the king. Yes, Mary, his mother, is the queen because Jesus is the king. Just like Bathsheba was the queen over uh, the kingdom in the reign of Solomon, her son, the king. In the Bible, the role of the queen was to be an advocate on behalf of the people. She was the voice of mercy in the court of the king, interceding for all people. And Mary can intercede for us like those peasants. We know this from 1 Kings 2.19. Mary is part of our defense team. So I should have hope in the judgment of God. So should you. I and you too have his mother on our side. And when we offer our prayers and sufferings for our loved ones, we should place them into her hands because she takes them to Jesus. This is Mary in consecration to Jesus through Mary. Now I'm excited to have our next guest. A few months ago, we had Daniel O'Connor on the show to do the series that we did on the end times. And I was just so excited to have Daniel on. He's one of my favorite guests. He's one of the ones I really look to to learn more about our faith. Uh, that I was so excited that I did most of the talking and I felt bad. So we said, we got to have Daniel come back because his views are outstanding and his teachings of church theology are great. So let's sit down with Daniel O'Connor and learn more about judgment. Today, we talk about something very important that's misunderstood and people have interest in, and that is what happens when we die? Well, we know that we go through a judgment, but as we mentioned in our teaching section, there's two particular, or two judgments, a particular judgment and a general judgment. Let's start with the particular judgment. What is it and what is it like? The particular judgment, this is, this is the moment we are all waiting for. This is the moment we stand in front of our Lord Jesus Christ and render an account for everything, as he said, every idle word even. So every action, every word, every deed, everything done and everything we should have done but not done. Standing before the thrice holy God, our Lord Jesus Christ, God himself. So that's very, in one sense, terrifying and overwhelming and fearful, but really 
we should be excited. We should long for this day because we can have trust in his promises. How do we prepare for it? Get your soul ready. Don't get your, don't worry about your body. I mean, sure, you know, stay in good health as much as you can, <laughs> but work, get your soul ready. Remain in a state of grace. I, I think you mentioned this last week. The key to re- being prepared for death is the same thing as being prepared for the particular judgment, which happens immediately after. It is appointed for men to die once, the scripture says, and then the judgment. So we prepare by having our souls ready, absolutely trusting in Jesus. And there's a lot of particulars that can help us in this regard as well, which we'll, have, we'll be talking about in the upcoming minutes. Now, we don't always know everything, but we do have some hints in Scripture and the writings of theologians. What do we believe it'll be like? Is it instantaneous right at the moment of our death? Will our Lord be seen or just heard? What, what do we think it'll be like? I believe, and this is certainly the seems to be the consensus of the theologians, we will see him wow. right there. I, I was reading a mystic uh, where Jesus describes to her the walls in the room we're in, the, the walls falling down. And then before us, Everything, eternity, heaven, hell, purgatory, and our Lord Jesus Christ standing there, of course, with his wounds, his five wounds, which he preserves to show both his mercy and his justice. So we will see him immediately. No delays. Some some, uh, some Protestant uh, thinkers in the past have speculated, okay, well, maybe when we die, our souls kind of go to sleep for who knows how long until the end of time. No, that was condemned as a heresy in the Catholic Church. We will see him immediately. And we will be judged by him immediately. And what about the Father and the Holy Spirit at this point? Yes. Well, certainly they're certainly with him. <laughs> they, you know, they're never separated. He is consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But it is fitting for he himself to be the one that we directly see because he is our Redeemer. And we're trusting in his mercy and he's going to make – and this is the most inspiring thing about the particular judgment. It's this overwhelming act of mercy that he makes immediately before, immediately along with it really because he wants to save as many souls as possible. He did everything he possibly could on earth. He suffered, he he shed every last drop of his blood Mm -hmm. so that he could do everything he possibly could to save even the most obstinate sinner. This is why we can have such hope for everyone. No, don't ever make any assumptions about a soul who died. You know, Daniel, that brings us up to one of the questions I had is a lot of times I've known people that uh, we've seen at least objectively living in mortal sin. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we don't know the state of their soul. Only God does. But how and why should we have hope for even that kind of a sinner that was living in objective mortal sin, objective grave sin? Yeah, and object, and that's we have to be— honest about this is probably the fundamental question. I mean, even scripture speaks of those before the times of Christ being slaves because of their fear of death. So we're naturally terrified of death. It's the one certainty, death and taxes. But no, really just just (laughs) death is the certainty. That's the only thing you know about the future is that you'll die. So so it's it's a natural human thing to be terrified of this. But Jesus, um, he tells the mystics, above all St. Faustina, And anyone who's read her diary, this passage is going to really be ingrained in their memory when he speaks of coming to the soul three times, Mm -hmm. doing everything. 1486. You even remember the number. So look it up if you have the diary there, 1486. And what does St. Faustina say describing this? She says, if a soul shows even a flicker of goodwill, the mercy of God achieves the rest. Daniel, what, what, what does the church teach or what do we know about what might happen immediately after the particular judgment? This is equally important. Immediately after the particular judgment, you will experience your, your fate if it's uh, your sent, the result of your sentencing, whether it's hell. Your grade on the your exam. Your grade, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, you know, it's all grade. No, no, of course not. But yes. Wh- You're an instructor. What, yeah. You know this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, may God be more merciful to me than I am on my <laughs> students. Yes, I, sh- I suppose I should be uh, showing more mercy there. But the, uh, be merciful that you may obtain mercy. Um, that's one good way to prepare. But you will immediately experience, if you are ready for heaven, you will immediately experience the beatific vision. The, the souls who are to be saved, they will experience the beatific vision, the vision of God himself, immediately after the particular judgment, or if they are in need of purgatory time, immediately after that. Now, if let's flip that now. Mm-hmm. A soul that is destined, unfortunately, their choices uh, for hell. 
will they not behold the vision of Christ because they will not behold the beatific vision? Will they only just hear him at their particular judgment? That's a very interesting question. I've pondered that a lot myself. We cannot say that they have the beatific vision. They will in some sense see Christ, but we call it a vision in the Catholic Church to, to emphasize the fact that no work is needed. Here on earth, we have to intellectually really think about things and work on things. In heaven, you just directly behold God's mm -hmm. essence, and that completely fills you with all possible joys. So the damned at their particular judgment certainly will not have the beatific vision, but they will see Christ's humanity, perhaps, just like the reprobate on earth saw his humanity, and that will be to their condemnation. So, Daniel, let's jump into the last judgment, or the ju what I call the general judgment, and I think the catechism does. What is the general judgment, and why do we need it? The general judgment is absolutely necessary because you can't possibly have everything settled in your own particular judgment. There's a couple reasons that's clear. First of all, there's a lot of time in history left after your own particular judgment. We don't know how much time, but a lot, most likely. Secondly, your particular judgment is only about you. It's only about settling whether you're going to hell, heaven, or purgatory. Well, heaven with a stop in purgatory. This purgatory is not there forever. <laughs> There's still an almost infinite amount that needs to be settled. The catechism says that ev the God's justice may be made clear in all things. Every single injustice must be, re must be complete. It must be eradicated. It mu we must see. We must not, that must not only be true, we must all see it. Both the reprobate and the elect, everyone must see how God's justice is absolutely fulfilled in everything, even by whether his permissive will or his ordained will. We will see on Judgment Day in accordance with what every single person— On the person, general judgment. The, the general judgment, yes. Mm -hmm. That last day, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, uh, that, that it's only at the end of time because it has to deal with everything that's ever happened. We will see how everything— was a perfect uh, contribution to his plan. So that will be the end of purgatory at mm -hmm. that time too. That's another So key. the souls that are alive on earth will never experience death then, right. correct? Right. Okay, so then what happens after the general judgment? After the general, general judgment, it's heaven forever until the end of, and not, not until the end of time, until, <laughs> you can't say when until, because it's the world without end. And I would just, I would just, I would implore you to meditate on that. Every night. I mean, meditate on the four last things every night, but especially the world without end, heaven. That's all that follows the general judgment. There's no do-overs. There's no reincarnations. There's no redos of the world. It's the general judgment and then heaven. Think about it. You, you can't wrap your mind around it. Eternity is beyond our grasp, but you can get tastes of it. And by meditating on the vision of God, beholding him with all the saints and angels forever, and ever and ever, never ending. That's going to put this life in perspective, isn't it? Yeah. It's going to make you think of what St. Teresa of Avila said. It, it, the Bible, correct me, but I think in Joel 3, 2, it talks about this will mm -hmm. be in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Why there, and what's the significance? Well, it's, it's fitting, isn't it, for the judgment itself to take place where those things that are being judged have taken place. You know, God could just transport us all to some completely detached heavenly throne to undergo the judgment, but in Scripture it speaks of the judgment happening at this at this valley, this this physical place on earth, with that everyone, and now all the nations alive at that point and who have ever lived, gathered in this one spot. And how exactly can he fit them? He's God. He'll make it happen. He can, and and you can fit a lot of people in a small space, actually. So we'll all fit there. Now the angels were already judged, correct, mm. at the time. Uh, right. But they will be part of this general judgment, uh, gathering the nations, I think, yeah. is, is one. But how will they be involved? How will the angels be involved at the general judgment? They'll certainly be there. And actually, they have a very important role, don't they, immediately before the judgment. They have to gather up yeah, they all gather. the bodies yeah. because the general resurrection comes before the last judgment. Wow. Because we need to experience the final judgment in our body and soul because we are both body and soul. So we need to experience it in totality, all of God's justice, his whole plan laid out before our bodies and souls. Even if our bodies were cremated. Even, that's the, yeah, <laughs> even, even if, and you know, St. Augustine talks that this, this is, 
he's he St. Augustine wonders, well, how how can this be, even if in the case of cannibals, like they, you know, the same molecules were parts of different yeah. bodies. And the point is God is gonna make it he's God, he can multiply the molecules yeah. if he has to. He's going to collect your literal body from wherever it is, however it's scattered. I mean, please don't get cremated and scatter the ashes. Yes, don't do right. silly things like that. Right. You know, put in your will to get buried. <laughs> but because uh, that makes it easier for the angels. Yeah. But um your body you will be resurrected and then placed in your seat for the judgment. Not only to witness it, but to have everybody else. Will you be seated in a seat during your judgment? Yeah, just like this one. In fact, that's the seat. No, <laughs> that's interesting. I suppose you'll be seated in some way. Yeah, oh you'll my. be you'll I, be placed there physically. Wow, that's very interesting. Now, at the end of this general judgment, um, you said there'll be no existence of heaven. Mm-hmm. I mean, of, of purgatory, purgatory, but hell will be sealed. Right. And so now, all the demons that have been roaming the earth, their time is done. Absolutely done. Now the hell still exists, and we will we will still be aware of its existence mm-hmm. in heaven, but even that will, in its own way, redound to God's glory. Okay. It will glorify His justice. So Daniel, we're always grateful for you to come back. I guess the moral to this message and mission is to be able to stay in that state of grace, Amen. prepare for uh, death and our judgment by remaining um, uh, free of sin as best we can. And if we fall, get to confession. Daniel, God bless you again. God bless you. And thank you for allowing us to stop, talk with you again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Daniel. It's always great to have you on, and we look forward to you coming back again in the future. Now, let's go to Scripture, where we hear about how Jesus himself took on the judgment that was due to the world. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he was born our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah prophesizes that the anointed servant of the Lord will one day offer himself as a sacrifice to suffer vicariously for the sins of all people. The Lord will permit him to bear the chastisement that all deserve and will lay on his shoulder, the iniquity of us all. St. Thomas Aquinas comments on this passage. For a man to be liberated, the passion of Christ was in harmony both with his mercy and his justice. By his passion, Christ made satisfaction for the sins of the human race And so man was liberated through the justice of Christ, but also with his mercy. Because since man by himself could not make satisfaction for the sins of all human nature, God gave his son to be the satisfier. In the words of the old revival hymn, that is almost too wonderful to be, the creator and judge of the world took upon himself the judgment rightly deserved by all the world to set us free from the guilt and power of sin. It sounds too good to be true, but in fact, it is the truth of the gospel that makes us free. Have we taken this truth into our minds and hearts? terrible hour at which one is obliged to see all one's deeds in their nakedness and misery not one of them is lost they will all accompany us to God's judgment O my Jesus on the day of the last judgment you will demand from me an account of this work of mercy O just judge but my spouse as well help me to do your holy will If a soul does not exercise mercy somehow or other, it will not obtain my mercy on the day of judgment. 
Oh, if only souls knew how to gather eternal treasure for themselves, they would not be judged, for they would forestall my judgment with their mercy. Oh, how good it is that Jesus will judge us according to our conscience and not according to people's talk and judgments. Oh, inconceivable goodness, I see you full of goodness in the very act of judgment. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And please be with us next week as we continue the next of the four last things, heaven and what it's like. Now, I have a section of my book that describes these four last things, plus a lot more. It's called After Suicide, There's Hope for Them and You. But it's not just about suicide. It's about any kind of suffering or loss. So the information is there on your screen to help you or a loved one. So please pick up a copy. Until next week, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.